In this lesson, we're gonna set up something that is essential that we do before we deploy our app to the app stores, and that is set up an integration with our own email provider, an email provider that's gonna send emails on behalf of our application. Most notably and most importantly for us is the reset password emails. But you might have other types of emails as well that you want to send. Now, very, very briefly here, it's important to note that the types of emails that we're talking about sending here are called transactional emails. So these are things like reset password emails, notifying the user when a transaction goes through. They're emails that are considered essential to the functioning of your app. That is in contrast to another category of emails, which we call marketing emails. And this is basically everything else emails that are telling your users about new promotions, new products, updates to the product, anything that's non-essential to their experience of using your app. And the nice thing about Loops is that it can handle both these types of emails. We're gonna be setting it up here for transactional emails, but just know that you can use this for your marketing emails as well. I'll link to some more resources for how to do this in the description for this video. For now, let's go through together and create a Loops account. So I'm gonna add here my new domain, which I've also connected to my Gmail mailbox so I can receive emails at my new domain. That is an important step for when we are setting up an email provider like Loops. So you can see that I received a verification. So I'm gonna to have to go into my emails in order to verify this. So we'll go through the first steps of the Loops onboarding here. And then as a second step, we're gonna be asked to verify our domain. And so we can set this up just by adding in our domain that we set up in the previous lesson. What Loops actually recommends that you do is set this up on a subdomain. So that would be having one part of your domain address coming here before what we call the root domain. So here's the root domain. And this part here would be the subdomain. And you can make this whatever you want. So I'm gonna follow their recommendation here and send all my emails from this subdomain here. And then we're gonna be asked to set up an integration between our domain, which in our case lives in Namecheap and Loops. And so with each of these records, for example, this MX record, there should be a corresponding section where you can place this within your domain registrar, in my case with Namecheap. And it's literally just a matter of copying and pasting all of the values here. And then we've got some text records and it's just a matter of copying and pasting these guys in the appropriate section of your domain registrar where they let you modify the DNS records. And once you've added all of these records, it will take some time for them to be recognized by loops. So I've come back about an hour later and all of my records are here and verified within loops. So I'm going to continue to the next step and we don't need to import any contacts to do transactional emails. So I'm going to go through the rest of this onboarding. Now, normally within loops, when you want to send a transactional email, you come over to this transactional section and we're going to create a template email that we're going to fill in with dynamic data. But what loops also gives us, which is really nice, is a whole bunch of template emails that we can start with. And if I scroll all the way down here, we've got some blank transactional templates. So I could click on this password reset email, and this is just going to give us a nice little starting point here. I can add a subject line like your reset password request. I can add the name of our app like this. If I click this little arrow up here, it tells me who is this email going to be coming from when it lands in the user's email box. And then if we click on this button here that Loops has added for us, and we can actually add more buttons by clicking this little icon up here, but I'm gonna stick with the one that it's got. And you can change and add more information to this template however you want. There's just one thing that I want us to do here to this template, and that is if we click this button, we have the option to add a link to the button. So this is where the user will go when they click this button within the email. And rather than us just hard typing some value here, 
what we actually want to end up doing is passing this value in from our bubble app. So this will all become clear in a minute, but what we want to do is click this little button that says insert data variable. And a data variable is just like a placeholder value that's going to be replaced with some dynamic data later on. So if I set this to be the reset URL, that's the name of this variable. And I hit publish as my next step here. What I can do is click to review my API configuration. And so what we get here is we get the information that we need in order to set up an API call to loops. And so you can see here that it's telling us that it wants us to send a post request to this endpoint. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually just going to copy this and within my bubble app, I'm going to go back into the API connector and I'm going to add here a new API called loops. And the name here, we can just call send transactional email. We want to use it as an action, just like we did when we set up our call to open router earlier in the course. And we're also being told by loops that this is going to be a post call to this endpoint here. And then what we can do is we can just, if I just add in some placeholder values here, so we've got something kind of to look at, is I can copy this payload and I can paste it into this JSON area down the bottom. And what do you think is going to happen when I try to initialize this? Well, no major surprises. I didn't add any kind of authentication to this. So if you look, Loops is actually giving us a link here to the relevant part of the documentation, which actually explains how we authenticate. And it tells us that we should go into our settings and generate an API key. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down under my settings API, and I'm going to generate a key. I'm going to copy it to my clipboard. And if we read the documentation further, it's telling us that it wants us to add it as an authorization header. And it wants us to add this little bearer word before the API token. That is a convention that you'll find in a lot of APIs. So for us to set that up in our bubble app, we can always add a header with these values and then the API key. And this will work just fine. You see here that Loops is returning a success message. That is what it will return. However, it is preferable to do this at the level of the API provider itself using this authentication section here because I can add, as I mentioned, a different key for development and live. In this case, just to keep things simple, I'm going to add the same key for both. And for me to test that I'm receiving an email, I'm actually going to add in an email that I can receive emails at. And if I hit reinitialize, we see that this worked. And if I check my email box, I'm getting a message here from loops. And if I hit the button, I'm going to be taken to that URL. And what's interesting, of course, is that reset URL is what we set here. If I add something and reinitialize this call. Then in the new email, if I click this button, I'm taken to the bubble website. So this value here is the user who we're going to send the email to. And this value here is a value that's going to populate that data variable that we set up within the template, which I can find this email that we've set up here under this transactional section. And I can even make a few little changes here because I think everything's actually a little bit crowded as it is right now. And republish, no problem. Now, in terms of the reset password functionality specifically, I want to draw your attention to what URL we're seeing by default when I reset an email here. So this is using currently the default send password reset email action. And when I receive this email, when I click on it, note here the structure of this URL. So yes, there's the root part of our domain version test as we've described that only appears when we're viewing the test version of our website. This is the name of the page that we're on reset password. And then we've got this little question mark and we've got this strange little bit of text here that says reset equals and then this long blob of numbers. So what we have here is something called a URL parameter. And you can think of this as just the same as a field name, a custom state name, 
a parameter name that we send to a backend workflow. It's the name of a container. So the name of this container is called reset and the value inside the container is this number here. And what this number represents is an attempt that the user has made to reset their password. If I was to get rid of this, or even just to add some invalid value here and try to reset the password, I would get an invalid message because this number doesn't correspond to any particular request that a user has made to reset their password. And what happens when this action runs is one, yes, this email is sent, but two, Bubble creates a data type of sorts. It creates this secret data type that we never see in our database anywhere. And you can think of this as a reset password attempt data type. So it creates one entry in the database for a reset password attempt. And this right here is the unique ID for that particular reset password. The password here, if there's a corresponding reset password attempt in the database, then Bubble knows that it is valid and can fulfill the reset action. Now, when we're sending our own emails from Loops or any other external email provider, we need to provide to them this part of the URL, right? We need to provide to them the unique ID for the reset password attempt that the user has made. And the way that we do that in Bubble is we tick this little checkbox here, just make token don't send email. When we tick that, and then we add in a subsequent action where we're sending an email with another email provider, what I can do with this reset URL is if I reconstruct the address for this reset page as follows, then after this reset equals, I can add the unique ID for the attempt that the user made to reset their password, which Bubble is calling here a reset password token. So the token is what is represented by this unique ID. And I can have access to it when we tick just make token, I can have access to it via a dynamic data expression result of step one. So when we tick just make token in subsequent actions, we get access to the unique ID for that reset password attempt. In other words, we get access to that reset token that we actually need to be present in this URL parameter in order for the reset password action here that the user is going to fulfill when they hit confirm to take place successfully. And so if we were to, in addition to adding this dynamic data, update the email of who we're going to send this email to, to the value of the input email on the view here, that is of course this input over here, then what we have is everything we need in order to send a reset password email via our own loops account. And so let me test this out now. So I'm going to hit send reset email. And if I view this email in a web browser, so it's clear to see, notice here how we are still getting that reset token. And presumably if I try to reset my password now, I should have this successful message. And it'll be the same thing if I reset it again from my phone and I view this email on my phone, then here as well, I should be able to reset my password. No problem. Now there's one really important note, which is that we are always sending the user here to the test version of our application when we don't always want to do that. If the user is viewing the live version that we're going to deploy later on, then we actually don't want this to be version test. So what I can do is I can actually replace just this last part here of the URL with this dynamic data source called app version. What this will do is when we're executing this action from within the development or test version of our app, then app version here will read test. And when we're on the live or production version of our app, it will say version live. And you can see that this is a valid URL if I copy it and open it here in my URL. So this version live here is the same thing. It evaluates to the same thing as if we didn't have any version part of the URL at all. So by using this dynamic data of app version, 
then we can be assured that no matter which version our end user is running our app on, whether we're just playing around and testing app live and deployed to the app stores, we know that this email will include the link to the corresponding version of this reset password page. Well done for sticking with me here, the last two lessons. That was a little bit technical, a little bit this working reset password function, which is what